AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey, welcome to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Great show lined up today. We got a gentleman who I've actually had a chance to speak to a couple different times, Elon Berman, who's the vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council, which is a nonprofit U.S. foreign policy think tank. Lots to talk to him about. And then Cam Edwards from NRA Television, NRA Radio, to talk about a couple different things, including the uh, those of you following the shooting in Toronto the other day, which, like everything, it's a, one of the most challenging places in the northern hemisphere to get a firearm. Um, and there was, I think, 27 shots fired by this gentleman with a handgun. Uh, and we're also going to talk about a little report. A report came out, uh, a government report, that uh, admits that AR-15s are not weapons of war, as if we needed a report to tell us that, something we already knew. But um, let's start off today. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on uh, around President Trump's tweet responding to uh, Iranian President uh, Rani, who was... Uh, talking about the quote-unquote mother of all wars should the U.S. continue to do whatever it is it's doing that's making him upset. But I want you to listen to uh, the left and in line with defending MS-13 and being on the side of everything that's against America. Listen to this guy, call him this Max Boot, reacting to the tweet. And I should point out, Max, the tweet was almost midnight sun- last night, Sunday night, uh, he tweeted, uh, and in all caps, to make the point that this is a real warning to the Ar- Iranians, you can see it right there. Uh, be cautious. That's the end. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. How do you see it? <clears throat> well, if anybody is issuing demented words of violence and death, I would say it's the president of the United States. I mean, it's, it's quite a pass we've come to when the leadership of a country like Iran is more stable and rational than the president of the United States. But, I mean, I agree with what was said. I don't actually think he is planning to attack Iran. Uh, I think this is really a ploy to distract attention from the horrible publicity he got for his subservience to Russia. But this really also, I think, underlines just how extraordinary his conduct towards Putin is, because look at what he's doing here. He is threatening Rouhani with, with death and, all, and you know consequences nobody's ever seen before. And what did Rouhani do? He gave a speech in which he said, you know, if the U.S. attacks Iran, it will be the mother of all wars. And likewise, if the U.S. makes peace with Iran, it will be the, uh, the, peace of all, the mother of all peace. Uh, so this was not some true attack on the United States. Uh, it was just some rhetoric, whereas Vladimir Putin is actually attacking the United States, as we know from his own director of national intelligence, and Trump has nothing to say about that. Moreover, today, or sorry, uh, yesterday, uh, Mike Pompeo, you know, gave a tough speech about Iran at the Ronald Reagan Library, a lot of which I agree with, and he was really pointing out the corruption and human rights abuses in Iran, which he's right to do. But how come Pompeo and, and Trump and all, nobody in the administration ever points out the corruption and human rights abuses in Russia? There's a clear double standard here, Wolf. I don't even know where to start with that one. Well, I mean, the left is embracing the leader of Iran uh, as more stable and rational than the president of the United States for decades. They have used the media to wage, announce, and talk about their ability and desire to destroy not just America, but Israel and anything else that isn't uh, uh, followers of Islam. And our president responds, and in all caps, you heard him talk about how it was frustrating. And listen to this one, CNN's newsroom, James Clapper, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, one of the 
criminals that we now know was involved in trying to rig the election. Listen to his response as he finds out live on air that he is being possibly being put on a list to remove his national security clearance. Mr. Clapper, you are apparently now on a list, according to the White House. Of two minutes ago, they would like to revoke your security clearance. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting news. Uh, I'm, I'm reading it uh, uh, and learning about it just as you are. I think it's uh, off the top of my head. It's kind of a sad commentary where, uh, for political reasons, uh, this is a kind of a petty way of uh, uh, retribution, I suppose, for speaking out against. Uh, uh, the president, which I think are uh, on the part of all of us, are, are born out of genuine concerns about uh, uh, about President Trump. Sarah Sanders, one of the words she used, I'll just fill you in as you're getting this information. She referred to you guys all as uh, politicizing and uh, that you've monetized, essentially monetized your security clearance by, you know, you along with a number of these other folks on the screen come on TV, paid contributor. Uh, with with the security clearance to say how you feel about the president, and they don't like it apparently. Well, the security clearance has nothing to do with uh, uh, how I or any of us feel about uh, the president, and I don't get the clearance uh, briefings. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't have access to any classified information. It, it's uh, frankly more of a courtesy that former senior officials and. Uh, the intelligence committee are, are extended the courtesy of, of, of keeping the security clearance. Have an education to use it, and uh, it w would not has no bearing whatsoever on uh, you know my regard or, or lack thereof for for President Trump or what he's doing. There's a lot wrong with that. Number one, if it is a courtesy, then you know what? Tough shit. You're going to lose your clearance, uh, and if you don't use it, why would you care? It's a courtesy extended by. Well, we're done extending courtesies to criminals. We know that this guy is right in the middle and was right in the middle of all of it. Uh, and then on NBC Nightly News, President Trump, he, he said the thing that led to all this. I want you to listen to his soundbite from NBC Nightly News. It's an unprecedented threat aimed at some critics of the commander-in-chiefs. The White House now considering stripping the security clearances of six former intelligence officials. They politicize and in some cases monetize their public service and security clearances. Most of the officials have worked for both Democrats and Republicans and have been tough on President Trump publicly. Isn't the president doing exactly what you just said the president doesn't want all these people doing? No, the president's not making baseless accusations of improper contact with a foreign government uh, and accusing the president of the United States of treasonous act activity. That may be a reference to John Brennan, former CIA director and NBC News senior national security and intelligence analyst, who called last week's meeting with Vladimir Putin nothing short of treasonous. I equate it to the betrayal of one's nation, basically aiding and abetting, giving comfort to an enemy. Now he's on a list that includes former FBI officials James Comey and Andrew McCabe, neither of whom currently have security clearances because they were fired. Michael Hayden, former CIA director, says the new threat won't have any effect on what I say or write. Former Obama National Security Advisor Susan Rice, silent for now. I think this is uh, uh, just a very, very petty, uh, a petty thing to do. Former intelligence leaders typically keep their clearances so they can talk about sensitive matters with their successors. A security clearance is also very valuable for former officials in the private sector. And so to lose one could amount to a financial penalty. But the president himself is not usually personally involved in decisions to revoke that clearance. To critics, it's not just Nixonian, it's political punishment. And it concerns me greatly if this White House is going to again break precedent in trying to uh, attack former members of the intelligence community because they simply express their views and their First Amendment rights. John Brennan tonight, by the way, declined to comment. The press secretary is also not commenting on another story making headlines out of Washington, the trial of former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort. Jury selection was supposed to start Wednesday, but that's been delayed by about a week to give defense attorneys time to review new evidence. Break precedent. It's a great, great reference, great term. This administration is, is going to break precedent by denying criminals access to national security information. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think any other forward-thinking, normal-thinking human being on the planet does either. These people are criminals. They should be in jail. They are working actively working against the, the best interests of the, of the citizens of the United States. And our administration is breaking precedent by revoking their national security. Good for him. Good for them. Well, and you heard 
how you know they they I didn't realize that they could use that to to uh, to be consultants in the private sector. That national security clearance has a dollar value to it that makes them valuable for companies. I get the the idea behind allowing former officials to talk in confidence with the president. They shouldn't have access if the president doesn't trust them, which clearly no one should trust them. So. But also last night, I want you to listen in on uh, President Trump continues to go out and talk to the people. And I think it's imperative. It's important. I think it's the thing that the media is going to continue to miss on as he continues to cultivate uh, Republicans and conservatives. Uh, but, but he's basically at an event last night talking about globalists who apparently uh, I've coming to realize are probably the, the major uh, force behind all the problems in the world today. Listen up. After many years of decline, American manufacturing is coming back bigger and better and stronger than ever before. It's happening. We're in the midst of a great economic revival in the United States. We've added 3.7 million new jobs since the election, including more than 370,000 in manufacturing alone. Remember, during the campaign, they all said, oh, you're never going to add manufacturing jobs. That's obsolete, they would say. I said, it's obsolete? To make things is obsolete? I guess they were wrong, right? I guess they were wrong. We're adding a lot more. Almost a million workers discouraged by the policies of the previous administration and, frankly, other administrations have now returned to the workforce. New unemployment claims are at the lowest level in almost half a century. Think of that. The lowest level unemployment claims. That's a big one. Despite how hard the left would want you to believe we're at the end times, uh, which I believe there's a little more truth to that than than most, um, President Trump is still continuing to he's the only it's the only way to get the word out about what he's doing and finally listen i'm going to switch gears a little bit and go back home so to speak and talk about uh, major league baseball i don't know how many of you if any of you followed the major league baseball all-star game this this past week but uh, there was an event an incident that is very disturbing uh to me uh milwaukee brewers have a reliever named josh Hader, and the kid is really really good apparently and i'm not sure how or why someone went into josh's past and dug up uh some really stupid ignorant tweets that he made when he was 17 years old they came out and they were they're troubling they're stupid and i at 17 uh, i'm not absolving him from blame and i don't think anyone was uh he apologized when it was brought to his attention and life goes on however at espn life doesn't go on because i want you to listen to this idiot on espn radio john ireland on espn's first take listen to what his response was to all of this happening listen up this deserved even a minimal suspension symbolically. You know, if, if you slap a suspension on Hader, you're, you're letting them know, to Molly's exact point, this is completely unacceptable. You hear people say that all the time. This is completely unacceptable, and then they don't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'm kind of a glass half full guy, so let me tell you that there is one positive thing out of this, and we're seeing it in society, is that now people are getting called on this stuff all the time. We mentioned the three examples, DiVincenzo, Josh Allen, now Josh Hader. Five years ago, Mace, I'm not sure that, that people get called on this and there's any type of reaction like we're having today. People just say, well, there's racists out there, there's haters, weird his name is Hader. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. haters out there. Um, that, and, and they'll just, now, if you're a public figure and you try and pull some of this stuff, you're going to pay a price for it, and he's paying it. Although I really, really wonder, in particular, yeah. because of baseball, you know, I was at the World Series this last year when Yuli Gurriel of the Houston Astros made an offensive gesture about you, Darvish. Yeah, he I, slanted his eyes and, up. At the and I was at that next game, and there were fans imitating the gesture. Um, there is something twisted in validating bad behavior mm -hmm. of players, whether it's a standing ovation or sort of joining in uh, the, the racism as what happened in Houston. Um, and I, I think that uh, 17 years old, old enough to know you don't put mm -hmm. nasty stuff. I mean, you can't even put portions of this on the screen. No. I mean, this is nasty I also, stuff. I also feel like, Dominique, and tell me this, I don't know if you guys all, do you guys all have kids? I, don't I know. do. No. Okay. Uh, and I got him. Dominique, I think you do too. Pretend this was your child, who they did that, and they put something egregious out on the internet, and they played sports, and they come back. Like, would you want that reception for them? No. What is that teaching? 
So I don't even know where to begin with this. But number one, the same group of people who are saying James Gunn dismiss it. It was in the past. It was his joke. They want to vilify a kid who was 17. Now they want him to pay a pen. I mean, if we go back and and, that, and that's the standard, I would argue that every liberal in this country would be put in jail. It's astonishing. The kid apologized, and there, it was very clear to me that he was incredibly uh, apologetic. But they want a symbolic gesture of, of suspension. And, and, and this, but this is who they are. They, they want to hold the rest of the world to a standard that they can't even think about living to and living by. Go back and re- look at the story. I mean, he, it was, it's, it's repulsive stuff, and I, it's not okay. But the fact of the matter is, is that, is, it, are we, is that what we're going to do? If we're, are we going to go back and hold you accountable? This is when he was seven. He wasn't in the public arena then. But are you going to hold the world accountable for everything they did at 17? Because I promise you uh, there are a lot of people, especially in D.C., and running these big businesses like ESPN. Uh, yeah, you, John Skipper. If you're going to go back and, and, and use the past to, uh, to, to criticize and demean, then, then you're opening up a, a closet of skeletons that I don't think you want to open. So, uh, anyway, we'll be back in a minute. We're going to talk with Elon Berman. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip-hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay-Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents. His wealth, his achievement. Capitalism. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius X. XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is the Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council, which is a nonprofit uh, U.S. foreign policy think tank in Washington, D.C., someone whose focus is on the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Russian Federation, which is the heart of a lot of things right now. He's Elon Berman. Good morning, sir. How are you? Oh, good morning. Great to be back. But we don't have enough time to cover the things I want to cover because the the, the craziness is ratcheted up to a level that I never thought I'd see. But let me, for someone that's been as steep in foreign policy as you have, especially with, with Russia, let me get your takeaway from the meeting and your response to the comments made at the press conference afterwards and, and why is the left making this out to be the end of the world? Right. Well, so there, there's a few things relating to the to the press conference last week. Uh, and, you know, uh, the media cycle is enormously fast these days. So it's almost like a lifetime ago. But, you know, it was uh, only a week ago. And a lot of things transpired that I think are going to have uh, some pretty long term ramifications. The first is obviously uh, what the media has led with, which is uh, the appearance that the president, uh, after his two hours of one on one conversations with Vladimir Putin, that he seemed to side with uh, the Russian leader over the U.S. intelligence community. That politically is a very bad look. It also uh, undermines a lot of the uh, really uh, credible concerns about uh, Russian interference in the elections, the ones that happened in 2016 and the ones that are coming up now. Um, But the context is also important because Trump met with Putin on the heels of a multi-day jaunt through Europe in which he spent a lot of time successfully pressuring European leaders to do more for European defense, to stand up against Russia. So there was a little bit of a disconnect uh, in terms yeah. of both the reporting and also what the administration was trying to do. On the one hand, the president was trying to be uh, tougher on Russia by causing the Europeans to step up to the plate. On the other hand, at least in person, he was trying to deconflict the personal relationship between the two leaders. That's not a small point, Elon. It, it's, and and I, I'm, I'm with you. I, 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 was, I, I think I thought in lockstep what you were thinking. One of the problems we have with President Trump is that this man isn't steeped in politics. He isn't someone who has uh, studied and understands that, you know, what you do and don't say, and uh, obviously by his use of Twitter. But a lot of times he says things and, and means them in a way that they don't translate, and the left gets to run with it. And they can because I, I, in his post – Meeting press conference, I thought I, I, I groaned a couple times like, oh, come on, he didn't say it like that, please. You and I, I think, knew, and all rational human beings watching knew what he was thinking and saying. Uh, it just didn't come across the way it should have come across. But he has been tougher on, any, on, on Russia than any president, I think, that I can remember uh, besides Reagan. And the left is seriously 
talking about and contemplating the uh, the news around he, he might be a Russian agent. I mean, that's the story they're floating now. Right, right, and and uh, obviously that that uh, the optics uh, in that conversation lead what he's actually done because, as you said, his administration has done a tremendous amount to push back against Russia, not only in Eastern Europe, but to penalize Russian entities, to uh, apply new sanctions. Um, but uh, I think you're right. Look, atmospherics uh, in this context are everything. And the administration is, uh, I think, in many cases, very hard headed. And so the response that the administration has had to this type of criticism has not been to be forthright about the actual policy, which I think would be very helpful. But it has been to double down on what we saw in Helsinki. So a couple of days after the president got back uh, from his European trip, uh, the director of national intelligence, Dan Dan Coates, was uh, up in Aspen at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And he was blindsided on the stage when somebody told him that the White House was actually contemplating a summit in Washington as a follow on to Helsinki uh, between Trump and Putin. Uh, This, I, I think, is enormously unhelpful. Um, It further muddies precisely these waters. And it also, frankly, antagonizes the American electorate because, you know, on the eve of the 2018 midterms, uh, to have the guy that interfered in our elections the last time around uh, as a guest in the Oval is, I think, really a bridge too far. Let me ask you your thoughts around the president. I've never understood and didn't know the nuances of how that works. I've never been a fan of, of people that aren't in office having national security clearance. I understand why you would do it. But President Trump has talked about revoking six people's national security clearance. And I got to tell you, in my opinion, six people that I believe have committed crimes of of close to high treason. Your thoughts about that? that You clapper and Brennan, they're all talking about this being a petty uh, response to their their uh, resistance of him. And well, which is a light term because they they hate his guts. They're not resisting him. But I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that stuff. Right. Well, so I I think it can be both simultaneously, right? It could be something for a cause, but also driven by uh, politics and and sort of the desire to uh, to get back at these people. Um, Look, the fact of the matter is for folks that work in Washington, they know that government tends to be a revolving door. Administrations come and go. Political uh, parties uh, step in into power and out of power. And a lot of these people, as a courtesy, the uh, next administration um, or sort of the next uh, leadership uh, of the opposition party allows them to retain their clearance so that this revolving door, as it uh, circles around, uh, these guys may either advise from the outside or these guys can come back into power. And it's a seamless process because the clearance process in order to get your clearance is enormously laborious. It's something like 18 months to two years. So right. the idea here is to expedite, to grease the wheels of government moving forward. Uh, some people uh, at least are allowed to maintain their clearances. And, and a lot of them, um, when they step out of government, they go into jobs uh, in the private sector that allows them to retain their clearance. So uh, there is good reason, uh, I think, for at least some of these people to have right. active clearances now. Um, but certainly uh, it's at the discretion of the administration. Well, and I got to tell you, I'm talking again with Elon Berman, the vice president of American Foreign Policy Council. I always argue and and in everything that I'm doing and reading about uh, world history and American history, the fact that we change direction every four years, uh, and in some cases every eight years, presents issues that, that a lot of our allies don't have. You have longstanding rulers in, in, a, in a lot of countries involved in NATO, but the United States can, well, I mean, you can't have a more dramatic shift from left to right than Obama going to Trump that presents really significant challenges and hurdles, I think, to to national security and to foreign relations when, you know, the president on Monday is touting the horrors of America's past and apologizing. And on Tuesday, the president is saying we're the strongest country in the world. I think it's a, a, a piece of foreign policy that doesn't get recognized enough. I want to switch gears here and go to uh, President Trump's tweet around the Iran discussion from uh, President Romani. First of all, I, let me just acknowledge, all right, this goes without saying, but I feel like I need to say it all the time. I am a huge fan of President Trump, and I think he's done great for America. I don't agree with everything he says and does, and, and I've never agreed with everything anyone says or does. I think his use of Twitter can be great at sometimes. I think it's absolutely, he sabotages himself at others. But his response in, uh, as I think Wolf Blitzer put it, all caps, to the president of Iran was not a small thing. And I'm wondering from, from someone, again, who's very versed in, the, in the, uh, the Middle East, what your thoughts were coming off of the comment that the president made and then our response from our president. 
l- let me start by saying that I, I tend to think that not a lot of constructive policy is done via Twitter. I, I think it's hard <laughs> hard to encapsulate uh, complex strategies in 140 or even 280 <laughs> characters. So I'm not a big fan of, of tweeting in general. I'm not, a, you know, uh, it's good for snark. It's not good for strategy. Um, right. So with that being said, um, I think it's necessary to understand why this all came about. Um, so the administration since May has been pursuing a qualitatively new strategy towards Iran. And this is something that uh, President Trump talked about on the campaign trail. With this regards is to, 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 to policy and the the, uh, the nuke deal, the nuclear. Right, Iran right, right. Nuclear, exactly. Right? So, so okay. the, right. the opening salvo of the new strategy was to get America out of the nuke deal and to reimpose economic restrictions to uh, essentially uh, cordon off the Islamic Republic um, the way it had been um, and, and sort of let sanctions really dig in the way they had before the Obama administration started negotiating with Iran in 2013. So he's done that, but that ha- and that's already had a material effect. And so you see companies and countries beginning to pull out of the economic space in Iran um, very significantly. There's a tremendous amount of capital flight. I think capital flight out of Iran is now measured at something like $30 billion uh, over the last year. I mean, this, this is a, a pretty big deal, and it's especially a big deal when you realize that this hasn't actually started yet. The sanctions that are being reimposed don't even start to kick in. Some of them kick in next month. Some of them don't kick in until November, right? So everybody's already scrambling to get out of Iran in anticipation of the new policy. It hasn't really even and le- said. Hey, it. Elon, for the listeners out there that, that don't understand this, I, I've actually had the privilege of being in that country two times to visit uh, our armed forces. And when you say $30 billion leaving, I think that that's one of those things that kind of people just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. But to understand what $30 billion means to a country that is literally living in mud huts, this, there, is, there is literally no infrastructure in Iran. I mean, I, I, I can remember seeing the, the – uh, the, I stayed at Saddam's palace, which was this walled en- enclave with uh, – it was just amazing. And literally leaned up against the wall of this building were huts where people lived with families of four, five, and six people. The poverty there is beyond belief. $30 billion is a massive – massive amount of of uh, of revenue for a country that literally lives in in the dirt. So I think it's necessary to understand, right? 30 billion dollars is a chunk of change for us, but Iran's economy right. is much much smaller than ours. So the fact that um that this much money has left the country over the last year, I think uh indicates uh uh, among other things, probably the most important thing that it indicates is the fact that Iranians are really nervous. They're nervous about the reimposition of sanctions. They're nervous about their country's economic future. That's a big deal. Um, the other thing that's been happening, and uh, partially related, but not totally, is that Iran, since uh, the last days of December, so about seven months, uh, almost eight months now, has been undergoing the most significant sustained protests that they've had since the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Uh, there are people uh, right out in the street every day. They're protesting over economic conditions. They're protesting Can over I political conditions. I want to know why that isn't a bigger story in our media, because that has been happening. That hasn't stopped. It's gone on unabated. You've heard President and many politicians speak in support of the, the citizens of Iran looking to take their country back. But the left and our mainstream media has literally ignored that story. It's really uh, one of the most newsworthy stories of the year that hasn't gotten a lot of traction. It gets traction in some corners. And the place where it's really getting the most traction has been from the administration. So yesterday, um, or I'm sorry, over the weekend, uh, Secretary Pompeo gave a speech at uh, the Reagan Library out in California, uh, in which he spent a lot of time talking about Iranian people power. Uh, and about the fact that Iranians are taking their future into their own hands. And this was this was not a uh, full-throated endorsement of regime change, but it also wasn't a full, uh, not a full-throated endorsement of regime change, if you know what I mean. This was the administration saying, look, all options are, o- uh, are open. We support the Iranians in their quest for democracy. Um, this is, uh, it, it's not clear how this is going to turn out, but it is clear already that these protests are really significant, and they've impacted the leadership in a, in and, a substantial way, right? So those two things. And I want to ask you something. Economic, I want to ask economic you something. pressure and the political pressure that uh, the Iranian regime is feeling from the ground, um, those are what are combining to make the leadership really nervous, really antsy. And that's why uh, President Rouhani, Hassan Rouhani of Iran, 
uh, announced uh, about a day ago, he said that if America continues to provoke us, they will provoke the mother of all wars. And that's what precipitated President Trump's right. tweet, because it's important for him to signal to the Iranians that, you know, loose talk is, is uh, frankly, um, really unhelpful. And also the United States uh, has escalatory power here and uh, it won't but sit let by me ask you, uh, Elon, and, and just face threats. And you're but in your lifetime of doing the work that you do and, and becoming educated about the Middle East the way you have, is it what's happening in Iran, our ultimate goal with the foreign policy in the Middle East? Listen, you can be who you want to be. Just just let your country be who the people want you to be. This is what we want. This, you know, People always say, you know, we're not going to change the Middle East. We're not going to. Well, apparently the Middle East can change. And the people of the Middle East, in the Middle East that we recognize as something might be something else. They, they want a democracy. They want to be treated like human beings. They don't want to subjugate women and, and all of the things that we've been taught and led to believe they all want and they can't change. They're speaking up. And uh, uh, isn't it imperative on us to ma- help make that happen? We're the ones that, that broke the system down that allows them to stand up without being murdered. Listen, I think that's right. And I think we've tried it the other way, too. Right. So listen. uh, Right. Historical humility being what it is, we're really bad at regime change and we're really bad at predicting revolutions. And and we haven't uh, we don't have a good track record in steering them in the proper direction. Uh, And that's made uh, administrations uh, in in general, Republican and Democrat, uh, generally speaking, uh, very hesitant to support these types of forces. But right. we've also tried it the other way. We've tried this non-interference. We've tried talking to the Iranian regime at the expense of the Iranian people. That's what the Obama administration tried. And we saw what we got. We got an emboldened Iran striding across the Middle East. So the Trump administration, uh, it may be correct, it may be wrong, but they're trying it a different way. Uh, they're trying a uh, diminution in the power and legitimacy of the current regime, and they're trying support for the Iranian people. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about every four to eight years, us kind of changing directions. If you remember, at one point, we were arming the rebels in Afghanistan uh, against the invaders from Russia. And then a decade or years later, we're killing those same people. And having those people we gave weapons to kill our soldiers. Obviously, when you try to nation build, it's, it's fraught with peril. I mean, there's just no way other way around this, especially in the Middle East, when you look at the religious history and the military history of the Middle East and how it came to be. I mean, people don't understand the spread of Islam. Every square foot of earth that Islam exists on was taken by conquest uh, and murder and slaughter. And, and uh, you know, people talk about the, the Catholic, uh, the, the Crusades, and, and uh, the, the Crusades were actually in response to the spread of Islam across Europe. They, were in, they weren't out there trying to spread Christianity. They were trying to save it. And people don't understand that. And I mention all that stuff because that all goes to the heart of, of how we get, got to be here. Much like in America, if you look at the history of the Democratic Party, you realize who they've always been. Uh, these people, from a government perspective, have been led this way all the time. And they're telling us now that they don't want that anymore. And I think that that's – I mean, we should be knee-deep in this thing trying to help them. I'm a big fan of uh, playing the field as it lies, right? If you look at Iran, which is a country of uh, 84 or so million people, uh, two-thirds of the population is 35 or younger. The Islamic Republic, the uh, clerical rule of the Ayatollahs, is only 39 years old, right? So what does that tell you? It tells you that the majority of Iranians weren't around when the Ayatollah Khomeini was in power. They don't necessarily buy what he's selling. And what they're looking for is economic prosperity and connectivity with the West and the type of first world living that they see others have and that they aspire to. And this is something that we can communicate with them on. This is common ground that we can seek with them. Uh, We shouldn't be encouraging their regime, which is out of touch with them, to repress them further. Elon, first of all, thank you very much. I want to mention, guys, real quick, there's a book you need to read that was written back, I think, in 2009 called Winning the Long War, which is uh, Retaking the Offensive Against Radicalism. That was written. Elon wrote that book back in 2009. It's an incredibly fascinating read for people that are interested in how, uh, how we got where we are. Uh, Elon, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'd love to have you back, buddy. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. 
We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is the host of Cam and Company on NRA TV. He has become a friend. He's, he's also uh, uh, the reason why uh, every Tuesday we do Second Amendment Tuesday with Mark Walters and A.W.R. Hawkins. Uh, managed to snag a few minutes of this guy's time. He's busy as hell, but he is Cam Edwards. Good morning, Cam. How are you doing, buddy? I am good, Kurt. How are you, sir? I am, uh, well, I'm, I'm saddened by what happened in Toronto the other night, and I'm even more saddened by uh, the left's response to, to another public shooting uh, with irrational, result, with irrational uh, uh, consequences and, and, and uh, action items. Uh, a gentleman, uh, for those of you who don't know, a gentleman uh, pulled out a handgun, and I think he fired 27 rounds before he was shot and killed by local police. And uh, somebody from Canada had the audacity to comment, almost brag about the fact that, hey, we only had this one that killed a couple people, and you guys have hundreds every year. And, you know, my response was it would have been pretty cool if somebody early on in that event would have had their own handgun shot and killed this guy before he shot 14 other people. Um, but the left doesn't, uh, doesn't go there. And uh, I'm wondering, the, the Second Amendment issue is on the back burner right now because no one's shot and killed students like in Parkland. Um, at which you and I both know to not be true because we can actually do two things at one time. We can multitask. And uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are as we move into kind of the second full year or heading towards the third year in the midterms. Uh, you're going to see another Supreme Court justice that is going to be Second Amendment friendly. I'm wondering what uh, what you and what your friends and what the NRA is thinking of as action items in, in the next six to eight months that might be things that might be Second Amendment law-abiding citizens interest well i'll tell you i i think you know certainly an action item is going to be confirming brett cabin out of the supreme court uh and you know hopefully that gets done i think mitch mcconnell is talking about a timeline of early october uh that that confirmation right, vote would happen terms. and i think that's going to be you know uh priority number one uh and then priority number two uh through november is making sure that we've got candidates that are going to get elected to congress and to the senate that are going to support Second Amendment uh, issues. You know, we still have things like national right to carry reciprocity that we would love to see passed. Yes. Uh, but the roadblock has been the Senate. I think we've got the votes in the House, but you still need 60 votes for cloture on legislation. And we don't have the 60 votes in the Senate to to move a right to carry reciprocity forward. If we have a good November uh, and if we see some of these uh, blue seats flip to red, uh, I think that we do have a much better opportunity. Uh, and, and, and I think that might also... Um, kind of break the logjam right now, Kurt. You know, there was a time not long ago where you had blue dog Democrats who were pro-gun. They would vote in favor of uh, pro-Second Amendment legislation. And over the past 10 years, maybe 12 years now, those blue dogs have, have really faded. And now a litmus test for being a Democrat is do you support the most onerous, extensive, exhaustive gun controls possible? If Democrats run on that this year, and they believe that this year is the year that they can talk fearlessly about their support for gun control. If they run on that and they lose, they don't take back the House, they don't take back the Senate. I'm, I'm hoping that that'll be a wake up call to Democrats as well. That, you know, listen, this is a, a, a losing issue here to try to infringe on the liberties of American citizens. We all care about public safety. We all want to see less crime. But the way to to address that uh, is not by making it harder for law abiding Americans to exercise the right to keep and bear arms. So I think between now and November, those are the two big priorities. And then after, you know, we see what the landscape looks like, uh, then we can start talking about those legislative priorities like national right to carry reciprocity. We do have some court cases that the Supreme Court could be hearing before long if they agree. Uh, and again, you know, Brett Kavanaugh might be that deciding vote to start hearing some Second Amendment cases for the first time in nearly a decade. There was just a case out of the Fifth Circuit uh, last week uh, about uh, being able to buy a handgun in a state where you don't live. Like, as you know, right now, right. federal law says that I could, I live in Virginia, I could go to Massachusetts and I could buy a long gun uh, and I could uh, take possession of that gun there in Massachusetts. But if I went to Massachusetts, I tried to buy a handgun, I would have to have that pistol shipped back to an FFL in Virginia where I could take possession of it. Why? Well, it's, yeah. that's what the law is right now, but uh, is that a violation of our constitutional rights? There is a very bitterly divided Fifth Circuit uh, that ruled 8-7 uh, not to, uh, to to hear an appeal in that case. 
Uh, and so the next step for this case is going to be the U.S. Supreme Court. So there are a lot of action items, you know, right now. But I think the biggest is is making sure that we've got the, the pieces in place to ensure that our right to keep and bear arms is strong. Uh, because right. if we don't get Brett Kavanaugh confirmed, if we lose the Senate or lose the House in November, uh, our, our right to keep arms is going to be in a very precarious political place. I am, uh, I got to tell you, I am uh, with Newt Gingrich. I, I think he's one of the best political minds, smartest political minds of, of our generation. I believe we're going to pick up four to six seats. I, I really do. And, and uh, I, 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 given what I'm hearing early returns, that's a possibility. But I wanted to mention something. And I hear you talk about it, and I hear Mark and A.W. and everybody talk about it, and I, I've said it for, for years now. Uh, you can ban something, and you can restrict something, and you can make something illegal to have only to people that allow you to make the rules. You can't ban something from a criminal. You can't restrict something from a criminal because, by definition, the criminal is not following the rules that be, to begin with. And so it, it's a very simplistic theory, I know, but the fact of the matter is every law, in existence, that, that is around the Second Amendment only prevents or it hinders or impedes the ability of a law-abiding citizen to acquire a firearm. And, and that, that I don't know any it, – it really is that simple. Uh, I get the, the – you know, I, I'm, I also don't – I don't have a problem with background checks. I think we've proven as a species that you can't trust everybody, and I think that that's a rational, reasonable thing. Canada has a very restrictive policy. Uh, you're even talking about a third-party witness, credit character witness, and all the things that go with the same background check stuff that we have, uh, yet this, this can happen, and this continues to happen. You look at the gun crime in, in, in Illinois, and no, it's not because someone goes across the border and buys a weapon. It is because someone has access as a criminal to a weapon in Chicago. The fact of the matter is our gun laws don't stop criminals from killing people. Murder's always been illegal. That doesn't stop people from murdering. The fact of the matter is... I believe, and I don't know about you, Cam, but I would love to see a governor of a state stand up and say, hey, listen, to all you criminals out there, I am passing a law that makes it very easy for my law-abiding citizens to acquire a firearm. So if you're going to hurt somebody, do so at your own peril. That would be fun. <laughs> you, you may get that uh, this election year I, in some of the other redder states. Um, but, you know, yes. I, I think that you're right. And one of the things that I've noticed recently is it, it seems like there's a growing awareness of this very simple fact that, you know, if you want to reduce violent crime, you don't target people who don't commit crimes. You target people who are committing uh, a lot of violent crimes. There was a, uh, you know, there have been a, a number of officers killed in Massachusetts uh, this summer and uh, this year. Yeah. And sure. recently there were protests outside of a courthouse in, I think, New Bedford, Massachusetts. These were citizens who were protesting the light sentences that these criminals are getting. You know, in, in one case, the uh, uh, police officer, Sean Gannon, who was killed in uh, Yarmouth, Mass., yep. the guy who's accused of killing him had 110 prior contacts with police. He had dozens of felony charges. A lot of them were just dropped by prosecutors. A lot of them ended up in plea bargains. He did very little time behind bars, despite basically his entire adult life uh, of being one just, you know, chock full of criminal activity. And so... You know, Which is, this hey, is something hey, Cam, that, that the press me, doesn't I'm sorry to interrupt. Around. Like, we don't really talk about this. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say, let me just jump in and, and have you elaborate a, little second, a second. That's nine of 99 of 100 times in these cases is we're finding out that, that the system is failing in every possible way. These people aren't killing a cop because it's their first crime and they got caught. These are notorious, multiple felony, multiple conviction uh, hey, the prisons are too crowded for us to keep all these people kind of people. These aren't people coming out of school deciding to be a criminal. These are multiple-time felons that our system continues to fail to, to, to adhere and keep to. Absolutely. And so why on earth are we talking about adding a, a misdemeanor law to the books that's going to you know uh, fine somebody $500 if they don't keep their firearm locked up in their house at all times unless they're carrying on their person? Why are we doing that? when we're letting these repeat violent offenders get slaps on the wrist to walk out of the street, you know, and I, and I think people actually are starting to wake up to the fact that this is a problem. Uh, and yeah. before you start talking about, you know, putting more laws on the books, again, that are aimed at, at people who are right now legal law abiding gun owners, let's address the real failures in our criminal justice system. You know, criminal justice reform has been sort of a, a buzz phrase for a couple of years. And I've got no problem talking about, you know, the, uh, the, the sentences for nonviolent offenders. If somebody gets caught with a small amount of pot, you know, should they be going to prison for a decade? I don't think so. But let's right. also talk again about what's happening to violent offenders. 
because the number of violent offenders who are getting out on parole after having served, you know, half of their sentence is, is on the increase. Uh, and we've got this mentality right now among many politicians on the left. I mean, look at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She talks about wanting to uh, end private prisons, uh, which I, I imagine soon would translate into end all prisons. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, restorative justice and, and always looking for these ways to keep people out of prison. Well, there are some people, Kurt, that need to be behind bars. There are some people who commit crimes that are so heinous that they, they don't deserve freedom. They deserve right. to be locked away, and not just for six months or eight months, but for a prolonged period of time. Uh, and this, I, I don't know if this is going to be a, a hot-button issue nationally in the elections, but I think that there are probably some races around the country, and certainly there are a lot of people in, in uh, high-crime areas who I do think are starting to wake up to this problem. Well, i, I got to tell you two things. Number one, I, I believe we should have a no-holds-barred capital punishment for cop killers. If someone's willing to pull a weapon on someone they know is armed themselves and is a law uh, a enforcement officer and shoot and kill them, uh, I, I think we should have not just capital punishment, but once verified, should be like a six-month window. You kill this, you kill a police officer, and as a Christian, I'll battle my. Uh, I'll have that debate and argument at the end when I meet my maker. But I, I think that's number one, and number two, we always talk about this, and the left doesn't get this. And it's. I think it's one. Of, I think maybe they get it, but they they refuse to acknowledge it. A law-abiding citizen with a firearm is a deterrent to a criminal, not an incentive. Absolutely. And you're right. They don't and, get it. Uh, they, right. they, they don't want to believe it. You know, their, their foundational premise when it comes to guns is more guns equals more crime, even though we've got far more guns in the hands of private citizens than we did 25 years ago. And our violent crime rate is about half what it was in the early 1990s. 2.6 million uh, times a year. A study, a CDC study done in um, 1995, I believe it was, cited the, uh, the, the statistic 2.5. Four six million times a year, a law-abiding citizen uses a firearm in defense of their lives and safety or someone else's. Uh, yet that stat got buried, has never been outed, especially when you consider that Garrett, Professor Kleck followed up with his own report that showed the enormous number of DGUs done uh, every year. Uh, that is a, 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 a part of this argument the left has buried as hard as they can, and we need to make uh, – well, and I, I argue that – it's one of the reasons why there's never been a more important time for people like you in the NRA. I mean, the NRA is being put out as uh, uh, the, the ignorant left's uh, approach to history is that the NRA is the brown shirts, uh, when in fact the NRA uh, is the group of people that are protecting, uh, legally protecting themselves and their lives. And getting a platform to speak it like you do and have is, is I'm sure, you know, you, you probably surround yourself with like-minded friends, but I'm sure you don't uh, get greeted publicly uh, as a, a conquering hero in this insane liberal world that we live in now. So, uh, Well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, we do uh, every day we have armed citizen stories on Cam and Company. I think that that's really important. We also have every yep. day a segment called Our Deal of the Day where we talk about these sweetheart plea deals that these violent criminals are getting uh, because this information is important. And, and you're right. Uh, the anti-gun folks in the media and in and, and politics certainly are going to highlight those types of stories. But this is the sort of rhetorical ammunition uh, that uh, that we can use, uh, you know, when when folks say, "Oh, nobody ever needs a gun. What do you need a gun for?" Right. You know, we had a story yep. yesterday, Kurt, out of Alabama, a woman who had to shoot and kill a guy who was accosting her. This guy was out on bond. He had been threatening her. He was arrested. He was put out on bond. He goes back to her apartment, and thankfully, she has a gun and she's able to protect herself. Now, I'd love to hear an anti-gun advocate tell me that she should have been unarmed. They won't say that. Right. They'll just ignore these right. types of stories. But we've got to make sure that these stories are out there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Cam, thank you so much. Always a pleasure, buddy. Hey, thanks, Kurt. Talk to you soon. Winners and losers today. One of the reasons I enjoy working for this company is that we're giving exposure to stories that nobody else is. And I can't think of a more important group of people than young conservatives, and especially young black conservatives. My winners today, Matthew Handy and Adria Barrington, are both members of the Rocky Mountain Black Conservatives Summer Intern Program. These are young men and women busting their asses and fighting uphill in a nightmarish battle against a outwardly violent, uh, angry group of people. These two young kids who were in D.C., they were headed, actually, actually, they were headed to the Trump International Hotel. Why are they winners? Because they called an Uber and the Uber person, upon arriving at their location, saw that the young man was wearing a Make America Great a hat again, 
and would refuse to give them a ride. All right, think about that. A person refused to give two young black people a ride based on an ideological dispute. What does that sound like to you? Does that not remind you of what it was like in the 1960s, 1950s? There is no more under assault group than black conservatives and especially young black conservatives. And the fact of the matter is, not only did they they arrive, but they came out to speak about it. Their personal lives will suffer for this. And God bless them for having the backbone to stand up. But the fact of the matter is, and we say it all the time here, guys, the left is exactly the thing they say they hate. It is amazing what we're watching, what we're seeing. And uh, the loser today is a kind of a simple one. I, I wanted to give it to everybody in Hollywood, but I'm going to give it to Dave Bautista, who plays, he's in the Guardians of the Galaxy. He is enraged, along with most of Hollywood, in this pedophilia-driven, perverted world. Director James Gunn, who was fired because of, I don't even know how to explain it, but there's some sort of infatuation and uh, adoration around pedophilia and rape of children that, that, that there's some underground movement that's in love with this stuff. But James Gunn was fired because Disney found out that he had posted some amazingly disturbing stuff. Anyway, guys, God bless. Thank you. Thank you again to Elon Berman. I thought that was a tremendous conversation around a very simple conversation around foreign policy. And Cam Edwards, uh, the people at NRA and the people supporting NRA are doing amazing, amazing things uh, these days for your second number rights. You guys have a great day. God bless.